It has been another very busy week in the news. We had a stunning decision undoing the unanimous death penalty verdict in Florida. And then Mary Carlos Jimenez finally, finally said, yes, I'm running for Congress. So we have a lot on the plate today for our roundtable. With us today, Raquel Rocky Rodriguez is a government affairs attorney at in Miami at Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney. She was general counsel to former Governor Jeb Bush. Rosemary O'Hara is the editorial page editor of The Sun Sentinel. Chris Smith is an attorney in Fort Lauderdale with the Tripp Scott Law Firm and a former Democratic state senator from Broward. We've already started during the commercial break. It's going to be a good <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, the, the back and forth is already well underway. Good morning. Great, good morning. great to have you here. Uh, Chris Smith, uh, you spent eight years in the legislature. So let me ask you, it looks like um, uh, Governor DeSantis, Lieutenant Governor Nunez as well, they're really in the driver's seat up there, high yes. approval ratings. But they're getting pushback, especially from teachers in the state of Florida who don't like the governor's proposal. They want more pay. They don't like his plan. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think you're going to get some changes because, I mean, the Senate, that, which has the purse strings, Senate in the House has purse strings, a lot of senators are getting a little uneasy. Every week there's large groups of, of um, teachers up there. But the other that is coming to, and it came out during your interview, the other paraprofessionals are really starting to right. voice themselves. Right, the you cafeteria, got your cafeteria workers. workers, your bus drivers. Yep. Yep. I mean, all those other people are starting to right. voice their opinions. And so the governor has laid out what he wants, that he wants to you know, raise the minimum pay for teachers. But now all those other paraprofessionals are reaching out to their different senators and their legislators. Yeah. And so now this big, bold, audacious idea now gets fine-tuned, and especially when they start really going through that budget. You're going to see the fine-tuning and see who exactly gets those dollars and how much of those dollars. I don't think what the governor wants exactly is going to go through. He's going to get a majority of what he wants, but you're going to see some fine-tuning, especially from the Senate side. So why do you think, though, fine-tuning is one thing, but Rosemary, why do you think that there is actual opposition to something instead of nothing? Well, it's a big deal that he wants to raise starting pay, but for teachers who've been in the classroom for five or ten years, to see a starting teacher get paid more than they're getting paid, there's something unfair about mm -hmm. that. It's unfair that people in the Keys, are all, teachers are already making that. It, it's like Tallahassee thinks it's no, it knows best for all of Florida, but Florida is a very big state, um, and I think that that while it's a good step, it shows a little bit of um, lack of knowledge about, you know, what what's on the ground in Florida. Uh, Rocky, I seem to recall when Jeb Bush was the governor and you were his general counsel, he had a little phrase I liked, BHAGs. He mm -hmm. was in favor of BHAGs. <laughs> what, big, hairy, audacious uh, goals. Goals. goals? Yeah. All right. So, and he achieved a lot of them. Ron DeSantis you know, seems to be kind of in that mold in, in many ways. I think he's very thoughtful uh, and he's done some good things. So Rosemary's page this mm -hmm. week praised him for buying the 20,000 acres in the Everglades so they can't drill for oil on it. And also prepaid Florida tuition, you know, families are getting back who have already paid in thousands of dollars. He, um, he has been off to a very strong start. I think I said last year after uh, he had been sworn in that I thought that it was one of the strongest starts of any governor in many years, and I think that he is building on that momentum. I think that his proposals, whether or not you might disagree on some of the specifics, uh, do have a rationale, an important rationale behind them. Right. For example, on the teacher pay, why do you want to increase starting pay for teachers? Because you want to attract more teachers into the profession, especially in this economy that is very strong. Right. And we're competing for the best and the brightest, and we need to recruit the best and the brightest. And so I agree with Chris that I think at some point mm -hmm. there's going to be some compromise to yeah. take care of other people in the system. But you got to start somewhere, and the governor is taking the first step, and I think uh, he knows where his mind is at, and I think that he'll work with the legislature to get as close to that as possible. Yeah. You know, we were talking earlier that it, when you watch a lieutenant governor, you know, in, especially <laughs> in this atmosphere of venom and and <laughs> spewing at each other that if we don't agree, we <laughs> hate you. You know, you watch a lieutenant governor and she's got this kind of charming and kind way <laughs> of really 
taking her opposition along with her to show them the ropes. You know, you you sort of yes. were in that position. Frame what you see right now as the difference between the beginning of this legislative session and especially the governor's first term where everybody was really going to work together and now where I think, you know, called it the rubber hitting the road. Um, it, it's not so kumbaya anymore and yet it's it's actually, at least in public, pretty civil. It's an election year. Oh, is that? <laughs> During his first year. Well, wouldn't that be the reason it would be just the opposite? No, well, well, people need to frame arguments now because you got the 2020 election coming up. And let's face it, um, the Republican Party um, has a Trump election coming up. And so in a climate in which the public di has disdain for Trump's personality, the Republicans need to make it about policy. Mm -hmm. So as you look to the president's reelection, even if you don't like the president, here's policies that you need to come out and vote for, and he stands for these policies. And I think that's why you see some of these very contentious issues are coming up, is mm -hmm. to take it away from the president's unpopular personality, but make it about policy to try and get the president yeah. reelected in yeah. Florida. Yeah, Rosemary, there is one area where I know your page has differed with the governor, I personally differ with him, which is on the nominees for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is down <laughs> two members right now, and all nine of the candidates who have been uh, given to him to consider, uh, which from a commission which he named, mm -hmm. they're all members of the Federalist Society. Now, forgive me, I'm just going to have to say, <laughs> I find the Federalist Society very, very conservative. I would like to see some nominees who come from across the spectrum, uh, judicially speaking. Well, imagine that every member, every nominee for the Florida Supreme Court was a member of the ACLU, mm -hmm. a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Wouldn't like that either. How would Republicans feel about that? Yeah. This is the equivalent of that. It's like you have to get your ticket punched with the Federalist Society in order to get nominated for the bench in Florida. There were other, there were 32 um, good nominee applicants, 26 um, were members of the Federalist Society. The word is out in Florida. If you yeah. want an appointment to the bench, join the Federalist Society and get in lockstep with this ultra-conservative orthodoxy. Before, I need to, before I need we to take respond. it, I was going to say, we, we were headed to a commercial break, but I just really need Rocky to weigh in on this. And, and isn't that the prerogative of the party in power? It is the pro Elections have consequences. And if you voted for Ron DeSantis or you voted against him, you knew that the consequence was going to be that he was going to appoint judges that, in his view, applied the law without legislating from the bench. And that is exactly what he is doing. And I must take issue with the conclusion that if you're a member of the Federalist Society, you are per se a conservative. It is an organization for libertarians and conservatives, right. and it does not take public policy positions. I'm a long-term member from the day that I was a law student of the American Bar Association, and I was an active member of policymaking, and they took p positions that judges would eventually rule on. They lobby, they file amicus briefs. The Federalist Society does no such thing. It is about education, and we have it people who are money. liberals. It raises money. It is for a nonprofit. And it, mm -hmm. it does it not take money. positions on mm -hmm. politics. It does not endorse candidates. I would and, disagree. And there are, I know plenty of liberals who are, go to other programs and are members because they like the educational aspect. If you, have any of you ever been to a Federalist Society meeting? I have. Would, you I have, have different views. You have debates. Yeah. You have people across the spectrum. And I'll tell you that even within the so-called, you know, the libertarian to conservative wing, we have vehement disagreements yeah. on many yeah. topics. All right. Well, I didn't mean to say that <laughs> it's a homogeneous group. I know that there is a variety, but on the political spectrum, I just, from my point of view, it is certainly center right and to the far right. And those that are getting appointed judging, are from the center right. Those that are getting appointed aren't a diversity of thought and a diversity to reflect the state of Florida. And I think that's a point of contention also yeah. with some of these appointments. And what's going yeah. to look like our Supreme Court will not look anything like the state of Florida. On that note, we will be back with more of Roundtable mm. and Fuego in just a few minutes. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. A very lively roundtable on this beautiful Sunday, one week before the Super Bowl. We may get to that one time, but we're really, right now, we're, gonna, we're talking politics. And I want to talk about Carlos Jimenez, the longtime Miami-Dade mayor, who this week finally said, yes, 
I am going to run for Congress. The 26th district, Debbie Mukherjee Powell, is mm -hmm. the incumbent there, although Car Carlos Jimenez has some opponents in the Republican primary. Um, Rocky, uh, you are a Republican, and here he announced his candidacy standing on the tarmac, as it were, <laughs> waiting for President Trump to arrive for that RNC meeting. And he did it in a tweet that, frankly, I, I just sort of rocked me. Maybe we can put the tweet up on the air and you can see. Here is what uh, he said. Uh, Welcome to Miami at Real Donald Trump. Thank you for all you have done for our economy and to fight socialism. I look forward to standing with you against the radical left who are determined to turn the U.S. into Venezuela. I'm running Join Florida 26 fight here. I mean, really, here's this moderate Republican we've known for years and years, you know, not especially partisan, talking about, yeah, I'm running against the radical left that want to turn America and Florida into Venezuela. I mean, is that the, the Carlos Jimenez that you know? It, it doesn't sound like him, but when you're mayor, you're not really uh, talking about those, those topics. You're getting things done. Uh, yeah. I think on both parties, usually when we've had mayors, they've been more focused on doing the job. But when you're, you're running for Congress, I think you have to differentiate yourself from the people you're running against. And in this case, you know, we now have the Ocasio-Cortez phenomenon and the socialism and people who, who think that socialism is a good idea and capitalism is a bad idea. And there's this, uh, I think, uh, a debate that has to be had about the danger of going down the path that does not see the threat that even acknowledging any bit of socialism as part of the philosophy of our country can lead. And, you know, Venezuela did not become the Venezuela it is today overnight. It started with the election of um, a, uh, a, a well, Hugo Chavez, Chavez 20 who, years ago, yeah. who fooled the, the people, who basically, you know, bribed yeah. them, right, but and, I think we're and the, this is where we me, are I now. Think, I think we're in the weeds here. Yeah. I mean, it's a long way from Hugo Chavez in 1999 to 2020, and Carlos Jimenez running for I, I think Congress. your point is, so we say it's a swamp. And all this negativity, negativity, negativity. Now we have a mayor who wasn't exactly, you know, that negative. Now is going to wants to go to Congress, and the first thing he does is get swampy and start with negativity <laughs> like that. Can we, can I mean, and, and that's and that's the problem that we have in politics now, and <laughs> what what has been created in politics now is that a person who we've seen as a mayor who's not particularly partisan. Now I want to go to Washington, so you know what I got to do. I got to out Trump Trump can we in put order up to get that, to Washington. Can we put up that tweet one more time? Because I want to show you something that I thought was very telling. If you look at the photograph used on that tweet, it's uh, while we're putting it up, it's, it's win red. And, right. you know, some people might not understand what win red is. Win red was the Republican answer to the Democrats Act Blue, which is essentially mm -hmm. a very large grassroots mm -hmm. fundraising mm -hmm. apparatus for small donations. And just that picture... Carlos Jimenez for Congress with the win red sort of shows you that this is being operated on a national level. And he's going to be in a primary with a, a restaurant owner from Miami who is mm -hmm. uh, very active yeah. in... Mm -hmm. Arena, Villarino. Villarino, who is very active Wonderful in... Wonderful person, by the way. ...their party and has appeared with the president here many times, and Omar Blanco, who is um, a firefighter, union man. And so... He has, to, Carlos Jimenez has to go right for the primary. And the question is, when he, if he gets to the general, Rosemary, he's in a, running in a district that is sort of very mixed and independent. Yeah. And, and Debbie Mukarsel Powell, who has been running it yeah. as the incumbent, yeah. that's going to be a really interesting race to see what he does in a campaign to flip what he has started now. Right, and I think what he started now was to flip what he did a couple years ago when he said that he was, he was voting for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And so, so with that, the big storyline out there, now here comes President Trump and you want, he saw what President Trump did for Governor DeSantis in Florida mm -hmm. and he wants the yes. machine behind him. So this tweet was his way of saying, I'm in, and I agree with you. I think it's hugely disappointing 
for somebody who you've seen, who you've had a lot of respect for, mm -hmm. for getting things done, suddenly say that everybody wants to turn mm -hmm. our country into a social, the radical left wants socialist Venezuela to define our country. Suddenly it's like, who is this guy? Yeah. Well, it's kind of boilerplate rhetoric. Right. Uh, I do want to say that a, a friend of ours, uh, Anna Navarro, uh, who appears on The View, is from Miami, is a lawyer who was born in Nicaragua, uh, who's a really witty person. She issued her own tweet, and I'm just going to read a bit of it. She called this demagoguery, and she said, stop exploiting people's trauma, win on the merits, campaign on the issues and your long record. Venezuela's Maduro kills, assaults, and jails opponents. Are you uh, really accusing Democrats of wanting to do that in America? Come on, Carlos, you're better than that. Right. I mean, that boy, last line says it all. Yeah. You know, we've seen someone who's better than that, but immediately out the gate starts being swampy and, and getting into this type of rhetoric. Politics, can't we all be real? <laughs> Stay tuned, we're coming right back. <laughs> On this Sunday, a really great round table with Rosemary O'Hara from the Sun Sentinel, Rocky Rodriguez, Chris Smith from the Trip Scott Law Firm, and you changed your law firm, so now you are with... Um, Buchanan, Ingersoll, Buchanan and Rooney. Buchanan and Rooney, good, yeah. great firm. It takes up a lot on the line. All right, so <laughs> we go we, by Buchanan. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to need a little help understanding this. So, Rocky, let me begin with you. The state Supreme Court this week, in a four-to-one ruling, as I understand it, said a unanimous verdict is no longer necessary in a death penalty case. Is that essentially it? Um, let me tweak what you just said because I think people confuse the verdict of guilt which does require mm -hmm. unanimity yes. with the death penalty recommendation and the step in between. All right. So when a uh, defendant is convicted of murder in the first degree, they, are, uh, they do not automatically get the death penalty unless there is a unanimous jury finding of one or more aggravating, aggravating. circumstances, mm -hmm. like a, a committing, <clears throat> um, having prior felonies, or a particularly uh, cruel and atrocious um, action like torturing somebody mm -hmm. or raping them and beating them savagely. That always was the law that you had to have an, a unanimous verdict of the jury on one or more aggravators. What happened in 2016 is that the state su the Supreme Court at the time expanded on it and said you also had to have unanimity on selection for death penalty which meant a balancing of the aggravating factors and the mitigating factors like alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, trauma as a child to decide whether or not as a matter of judgment the death penalty was going to be applied even if the person was eligible yeah. due to the aggravators. They, um, they interpreted a, another U.S. Supreme Court case to require it, but they, they were wrong. And that is why the the previous uh, court you're saying yes state the court state was wrong. supreme court was wrong. It is not required. It's never been a requirement from the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of either the Fourteenth Amendment or the Eighth Amendment that the jury be involved in the actual recommendation uh, un unanimously. So um, that is why this court decided to address the issue. Uh, now, obviously, it does not have any impact at this moment on death penalty that is applied because but, the state legislature mm -hmm. changed the process to require unanimity. Right. So well, I would I, like to, mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to say, it, ac it actually does affect a <clears throat> hundred or so mm -hmm. cases that that were pending right. possible resentencing. Right. And, right. And in the Sun Sentinel, your editorial, Rosemary advocated on this news hook for a repeal of the death penalty. Right. Yes. No. Um, it, it's true that the U.S. Supreme Court did not speak specifically to did the recommendation of the jury have to be unanimous in recommending that somebody be put to death and that the Florida Supreme Court interpreted that in, in saying, yes, it did. But I would say that what we now have in Tallahassee on the Florida Supreme Court are activist judges who have taken a ruling that they did not like from before, revisit it, and now say, you don't have to have a unanimous jury verdict. So they take that up and put it out. We have put people to death on 7-3 
jury recommendations. So you, we have 11 people on death who've gone to death row when the jury said seven, seven to five, I'm sorry, seven to five, we think sh should be put to death. It's okay, we're unanimous they did it, but only seven of us think this person should yeah. be killed. <laughs> and, we, are, we could well go back to this system, and let's remember 29 times yeah. Florida mm -hmm. has gotten it wrong, sent the wrong person to death row. Just this week, we ended up paying two and a half million to, to somebody else who got convicted for something they didn't. We get it wrong. It doesn't yeah. work well. And to kill somebody without getting it right and to and to think that this is okay, it's 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 against my values. Chris, wait, More yeah. morality. And I think this is going to be a bad trend. I think this was a bad ruling, but it shows a trend now. Um, we said earlier that elections have consequences. Um, judicial system shouldn't be a part of that. We shouldn't have a judicial system that's going to go back and revisit, okay, we don't like anything the last court right. said. Mm -hmm. I mean, judicial system is not the legislature. It's not like new people get elected right. and come up well, with new that's laws. That's why there are legal precedents, and right. generally the courts are very Honor careful them. about undoing precedents. And I think this is a first step in getting away from some precedents. And I think this this court, and I know there's disagreement, but that, that's what makes you an activist court, when you want to go back and, and undo precedents that have been set before. At, at this moment, Rocky, does this practically change anything besides 100, those 100 cases from prior to 2016? Well, what it changes is that it, uh, it allows the legislature as a policy matter, as the policy making body to determine whether they want to change the law again to allow non-unanimous jury recommendations or whether they want to keep it that way and continue to require unanimity in it the death recommendation. It also changes for those who got resentencing hearings because of that right. Supreme Court ruling that they are now in limbo and already yeah. in Polk County, the assistant state attorney there is wanting to get put to death somebody whose jury voted nine to three yeah. that he should be put to death. Well, let me just put, say that, one I'm, thing, I'm, though. I'm sorry, we are out of time. <laughs> Boy, this is really a topic we'll revisit. Come back. Come back. But anyway, thank you all for yeah. coming in. Great roundtable. Very thoughtful. Thank you.